the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda uh, helps a great deal to have this overarching uh, holistic view uh, and, and approach. The other missing link, if we if we know what is happening, if we have the technology, if we have the information, why is that we don't act? Uh, we need to act. But then uh, what holds us back from acting and for addressing the pressing challenges of the world? And, and I think that this is very much connected uh, to uh, political uh, determination and political will. But then how you qualify political will, it's, it's a very difficult issue. And how, um, I think that we are all aiming at a rules-based international system. Uh, we, are, we all aim at having a governance structure and a glo global governance structure that can deliver for the people in need, for the most vulnerable, for the victims of conflict. But yet, uh, we have something holding us back. And there is no simple answer on that. Uh, whether it be um, very concrete, you know, economic interest. Let's look at the arms race, for example. You know, how much money the world invests in, in uh, getting armed with our more sophisticated technologies? And what are the financial and economic interests behind that? What is the political will? What, what is, you know, our um, sometimes uh, incapacity to, to really use dialogue and understanding as a very strong tool. You know, the minister was just mentioning uh, that uh, as well. And I would say perhaps um, two issues. First, I think that the issue that you mentioned, Excellency, regarding the need of regional alliances, of regional dialogue, of the role of local governments, it's extremely, extremely important. Uh, the understanding that when we drafted the UN Charter 73 years ago, uh, they were uh, the emerging uh, actors were not there yet, but now they are here, and we need to take in full consideration the, the enormous importance of civil society, of the private sector, of uh, academia, uh, of um, workers' unions around the world. So it's not only about the willingness of member states themselves. And finally, the role of the United Nations. The primary, the primary responsibility of the Security Council is, you know, to prevent and address uh, peace and security issues. And uh, uh, so uh, lately we have seen that more and more the General Assembly takes over and resolve the issues from the Security Council and has to address them uh, in, in order to, um, to expedite or have a response to critical issues, such as the Palestinian issue, for example. So I think that the United Nations um, is uh, or has uh, to strengthen its delivery capacity. We are working on, on that. Uh, the United Nations is indeed the uh, world umbrella, uh, the most representative and democratic, speaking about the General Assembly, and most democratic organ of the multilateral system. I think we need to give greater authority to this Parliament of Humanity. The General Assembly is the Parliament of Humanity, is the place where we do norm setting for international law, and it has to really regain uh, power and force. And uh, we need to also have greater balance between the power of the Security Council, our Parliament of Humanity, which is the General Assembly, and our Social and Economic Council. We also need uh, to implement uh, the very ambitious and structural reform process the United Nations is undergoing. That's why I, when I selected a theme for this year's General Assembly, I, I was very, um, uh, very pleased to come up with this phrase, making the United Nations more relevant to all. Our organization needs to be more relevant to the people we serve. We need to be closer to the people we serve, and we need to bring the people we serve 
closer uh, to the United Nations. So there are no easy feats, no easy answers, but I think that the multilateral system and a rules-based uh, international uh, governance system is what we need, even in difficult times. And uh, to, just to end, perhaps, something that is very important. We are now listening all this very strong narrative saying is either you go with globalization and multilateralism and the United Nations, or you serve your national interest uh, and you ex exercise your national sovereignty. And it so happens that both concepts both categories do not counter each other. They are mutually reinforcing. If you have a peaceful and sustainable world order and a democratic world order, then that reasserts your capacity to exercise your national uh, sovereignty and pursue your national interests. So both things can work together and they are mutually reinforcing. Thank you very much. Um... I want to just let our audience know that in about 10 minutes or less, um, after the two other panelists have had a chance to speak, uh, we will turn to you uh, for your questions and comments. So uh, prepare yourselves, if you would, mentally. Um, my, next, my next question goes to uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Somalia. I just like to invite you to share a few thoughts about how you from a war-torn country and as a as a former emigre um, in in Norway how you see um, the global situation and what should happen in order not to have cases like your own country again which suffered for so many years so terribly from this awful civil war situation Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, very good question. I want to thank first uh, the Foreign Minister and His Highness uh, for their warm reception. Thank you for the great hospitality. Uh, and I am again here this year as well. So uh, this shows the importance that we are putting into this gathering, we from Somalia, because this reflect is the current reality in terms of political debate that we want to take part of. Let me start first, before I answer your question, by saying in terms of an interconnected wall, Somalia may be best uh, uh, represents the uh, easiest example. We are the gateway between Africa and Middle East. We are the only nation in the world that connects the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean. Our neighbors are Somalis to the side of Ethiopia because you have seven million Somalis in Ethiopia. Djibouti, they are most of them Somalians and then you have uh, four to five million Somalis maybe uh, in Kenya. That places us in a strategic location. Uh, on top of that, uh, people see Somalia as a war-torn nation, but in terms of a potentiality uh, from uh, resources on economic uh, potentiality, on agriculture, on fisheries, on uh, geographical location in terms of strategic location, on potential oil and gas and minerals and what have you, and our people who are now living globally, uh, give us and um, put Somalia in a strategic location in that aspect. Now, in order for us to maintain the progress we've made so far, uh, we cannot do that unless we work with our neighbors, either they are in Ethiopia or in Kenya or in Djibouti, because our progress is interlinked uh, with their progress. Now, how do we intend to carry that forward? Uh, let's take, for example, the tradition relationship we've had with Ethiopia and the relationship we now have with Ethiopia. Our thinking is as follows. There are seven million Somalis, originally Somalis, who live in Ethiopia, who are Somali Ethiopians. And if we don't have good relationship with Ethiopia, it actually in reality means not having good relationship with Somalis. Second, they represent uh, the biggest market we have as a potential business partner in the future, being 100 million uh, people. Uh, three, the only way we can have border security 
is if we have a, a strong relationship uh, with, with Ethiopia. Look at the case of Kenya. Our business is 100% interlinked with Kenya. Our economic growth, economic development, and sustainability in terms of security. Now, investing in Somalia means, in reality, investing in the region. Bringing about stability in Somalia means bringing about stability in the region. How do we prevent crises like the ones that we have had in Somalia for the past 20 or 30 years? It again comes back to the reality of how do we invest uh, as uh, global leaders. Uh, Somalia today stands in a position where we've made progress on political formation, on economic growth, on security. But the issue is that the world has been focusing on terrorism and how to fight terrorism in nations like Somalia. You cannot defeat terrorism through military means alone. You defeat them through investing in political processes, through creating jobs, through fighting corruption, through inclusive politics where women, youth, vulnerable groups are empowered, through putting system where people's hope and aspirations are seen through systems that they can recognize. How does, therefore, the world we live in today reflect the current realities? And why are we seeing new alliances made that are, are, coming, are, 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 are being made? The first, I think, question we need to look into how can we address the growing unilateralism and protectionism policies that are being formed globally? How do we address the question of competition that is becoming what is replacing cooperation? How do we again find a solution to the real reality of that? Is today's multilateral institutions, either being the UN Security Council, do they reflect the current world structure? Are they able to cater for the challenges we're facing? These are questions that we will need to answer. And how do we relate to organizations like the African Union that are becoming increasingly important? And how do we put emphasis into that? Finally, the biggest challenge that we see now from our end is that how do we change all narrative? People have this view, for example, of Somalia, of being a nation of piracy and terrorism, with leaders who are not able to lead their people. Things have changed, and our number one priority, therefore, is how do we make the world understand they shouldn't see Somalia for what it has been or what it is, but what it can be in the future, so that we can contribute to the world. Thank you very much. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. So, for a final comment, initial comment, uh, let's go to Europe. Um, um, Mr. Foreign Minister, um, my own view has been for a long time that our organization, the European Union, hasn't been performing uh, in the way it should perform to defend and uh, represent the interests of 500 million people. Where was the EU in the Syrian conflict, for example? Um, uh, where do we exercise the role that we could exercise with our economic power uh, in uh, efforts to resolve conflicts? So your country, your government, uh, you yourself are going to take the helm of the EU in a few weeks. So uh, share with us, if you could, your view as how you want to take the European Union forward in these six months, which are, I think, going to be hugely important when you think of what's going to happen in the next six months in Europe. Brexit is a disruption. Uh, we have a whole number of other issues. I'm not going to uh, bore the audience with it. So, uh, enormous challenges for the European Union, Mr. Minister. Yes, thank you very much. First of all, uh, let me tell you that I'm very honored to be invited and to attend this, um, uh, this forum. And I would like to ask uh, Sheikh Mohammed to convey to His Highness the Emir our appreciation for the excellent organization and the very friendly 
offer uh, for our stay here. I will permit myself to open a uh, discussion in a very candid uh, way and be direct attacking the, the subject you have mentioned. From my point of view, the most successful project in international relations was the creation of the European Union. It was for the first time that different countries, sometimes confronted with wars and crises and disputes, managed to create a unity which was based on a single market, customs union, freedoms of movement of uh, persons, goods, capitals, and so on. There is also the uh, very something, it's, it is difficult to imagine that so many countries accepted at a certain moment to have a single currency which was practically one of the main elements of the national sovereignty for, for every country. That's why I have to recognize that uh, the European Union is the most successful project uh, in the international affairs. But we are realizing every day that we can't do uh, a lot of things without a strong relationship with our transatlantic partners, with our partners from the East, with our partners from the West. We should not look at the European Union as a castle, a fortified castle with great walls around us. We are depending very much on our partners, as I said, be they transatlantic to the East or to the South. From this point of view, we are confronted with the same dangers challenges at the international level as the other countries. That's why the European Union should be much more interested in finding solutions for all these issues. You are referring to different specific, uh, specific uh, situations in which the European Union did not use its real possibilities, the potential to be involved in, uh, in these issues. From this point of view, for our presidency, we announced uh, uh, this week the priorities for our presidency. There are two elements which are, from our point of view of Romania, uh, a priority. The first one, ensuring the security of the Europeans inside and outside. And secondly, transforming the European Union in a global actor. I think we have all the possibilities to do that, provided we have the political will to use the instruments at our disposal. From this point of view, one of the priorities of our presidency will be the, the connection with the eastern part of, uh, of the continent and looking into the Arab world, Central Asia. And one of the issues which are now still very hot, the problem of the disputes between the JCC countries. From our point of view, our intention is to try to organize an event with the countries, um, members of the, of the JCC, and to try to contribute with all our possibilities to find a political solution to this. I'm sorry to say we were very preoccupied by, by the crisis which existed, because we always looked at this JCC uh, format as being a pillar of security in the, in the Arab world. And from our point of view, of course, if it's not working well, it can create a lot of problems in, in the future. I'm very confident that the, uh, the capabilities of, uh, of our countries, first of all, of our hosts, are very big. And I'm looking forward with a lot of hope for having a, an attempt to find a political solution to, to this crisis. We are supporting the uh, function of moderator of Kuwait, and we hope things will evolve in a positive manner. With your permission, because as I said from the very beginning, I will speak very candidly, I think this crisis, looking from outside uh, to, the, to the situation of Qatar, had a lot of, brought a lot of difficulties, but also opportunities. 
a few weeks ago we paid a visit, an official visit um, here in, in Qatar and we were really shocked by the strong development of some branches of the economy. We visited a diary factory here, a very modern one, one of the most modern, which are covering the needs of Qatar, but also is able to export to other, to other countries. And secondly, a very important issue, more accent on your behalf on opening your relations with the world. From, from this point of view, I appreciate, because it is demonstrated that a country cannot be, should not be a big one in order to play a role. Maybe sometimes the army is not the only argument for, for being very important in the, foreign, in the international relations. But if you have the, the will, the cleverness, the intelligence of it, you can play a very important role and we are counting on you and please count on us for, for finding a solution. From this point of view, as I said, the European Union, yes, we can do more. We have a system which is working with a high representative for foreign affairs. Our obligations as a president of the Council of the European Union is to help them and to offer all the conditions. And one of our priorities, I repeat, will be the opening of our relations and increasing our relations with Central Asia, with the Gulf countries, with the Arab world as a whole. That's why I'm confident that we will be able to do it. We'll have a chance to organize a meeting, a high-level meeting. Uh, I'm speaking about the level of heads of states of governments in Romania, 9th of May in Sibiu, and the main subject we will discuss there, it's an informal summit, but the main subject which will be discussed is about the future of Europe. What should Europe do in order to really play a much more important role, taking account the number of the population, the place in the international economy, and the very important uh, developments in the field of peace and security. Let me inform all the participants that one of the uh, very, from our point of view, a crucial decision of the European Union was to create a global strategy for defense and foreign affairs. And we have the instruments and we have decided to use them and Romania will contribute to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister. Um, let, me, let me make a little advertisement. I think in mid-February in Munich, when many of you will be assembled at the Munich Security Conference, that's a good place to prepare your summit for, for May. So we'll, be, we'll, we'll try to help uh, advance this. Now, uh, we have time for just a couple of questions. We have less than 10 minutes to go. Um, I see uh, somebody here in the third row. Um, if you could please uh, grab a microphone and, and let us know whether you have a question to the entire panel or to one of the panelists, and please ask a brief question. Don't give us a long speech. The gentleman here, yes. Is there a microphone? Thank you. I'm Kozem Sajjaspur from Iran. I was impressed by the panel. But the, the question that you asked in the beginning, the set of questions, one, was the, one of the most important ones was about the United States. And I didn't hear anything about the United States. My question is, when we talk about unilateralism or about the crisis that we had here, where is U.S. and how the world can manage the new U.S. approach? Thank you. It is for the whole panel. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, take two or three and then go back to the panel. The question number one over there, please. Hello, my name is Al Olyum. I'm from the European Union delegation in Riyadh that also covers uh, Qatar. I'd like to ask the panel about the um, wider effects of the Gulf crisis and specifically on the Red Sea. We have the Prime Minister of Somalia here. Uh, I think we have noticed some rivalry or perhaps competition between 
Gulf countries for influence in the Red Sea. And recently in Riyadh, there was the meeting setting up a new regional council on the Red Sea. Could uh, you please comment on that, any of the panelists? Okay, and then there is number three back there. <clears throat> my name is Samuel Aryan from Turkey. Uh, my question is for the United Nations. When it was created 73 years ago, it was basically projecting the power structure at the time, but now the things have changed. How could it be relevant to the people if it's only one country that is dominating its agenda and whatever its will, it's imposed, and it never really solves any problems? That's why most people don't see any relevancy to it, particularly when it comes to the Palestinian situation. And one other question to the uh, foreign minister about normalization. The Arab Peace Initiative initially said that would be no normalization until the withdrawal. Now we see some Gulf countries and others who are basically sidestepping the issue of withdrawal into the issue of normalization. What do you think that would affect uh, the overall security situation in the area? And finally, for the uh, foreign minister in Romania, why is, why is the uh, European Union not taking more uh, assertive situation regarding the Palestinian question. Why is it always giving deference to the United States and its, uh, its uh, full support to Israel? And we saw that recently in several UN votes. Thank you. Okay, you were supposed to ask one question, you asked three, and now we go to the last question, then we have to go back to the panel. The number four over there. Yes, uh, thank you. My name is Abdullah Baboud. I am from uh, Oman. Uh, I don't want to uh, turn this into an EU or European bashing, but uh, since this has been raised, my question to the panel is what has Europe done to the region? We have heard so many policies, incoherent policies, diverse policies, Mediterranean policy, an EU GCC policy, a G, uh, policy towards Iraq, one towards Yemen, but there is no coherency overall to, to the whole region. And what can they do, not only in this crisis, but to help the region to move towards more integration and cooperation? And to follow from that, what, has, what is left from the GCC, which is a regional-based, rule-based organization, through this blockade, that actually contradicts all the agreements that have been signed in terms especially of the common market which, act, which allows free flow of people, capital and goods to be transferred between the different countries. This blockade has actually undermined the whole of this. So what is left of the GCC and how can people respect the GCC if it doesn't respect its own rules? Thank you. Thank you very much. Great questions. Very little time to answer. I'm, I'm going to have to, I'm sorry to say, I'm going to have to limit each one of you to the, something like one minute. So, you know, try, don't try to answer all the questions, but just pick one or two, and, I'll, and we'll, go, we'll start with uh, Madam President and go uh, uh, through the panel. So why don't you start, please? This is working now. Yeah. So very quickly, in one minute, that's quite a challenge. But I will, I will answer the question that was addressed directly to the United Nations. And uh, indeed, I think that uh, the world has changed as uh, when we drafted the UN Charter 73 years ago, the world has changed. We have new challenges. Uh, we have uh, new issues on the agenda, but the principles remain the same peace, security, human rights, and development. I think that these are the pillars uh, that uh, we need to uh, deliver and uh, we need to be uh, relevant uh, to, to all people. The question was, why is that uh, the, the UN doesn't act, for example, on the Palestinian issue? And I have to tell you that the General Assembly has taken over, you know, in, in just two examples, a special session, emergency special session last year when the decision uh, to uh, uh, locate uh, the embassies in, in Jerusalem 
that was an issue that could not be resolved by, by the Security Council that came in an emergency special session to the General Assembly and was uh, addressed by all member states uh, and uh, we saw the result of the, of the voting, uh, the voting pattern which, uh, you know, a larger ma majority uh, really uh, called for the respect of the already existing resolutions regarding the Palestinian issue. And last week, recently, uh, there was a resolution on Hamas that was put forward by the United States. Uh, we had a voting process in the General Assembly and the uh, resolution was not approved by the majority of the member states. What I want to say is that the General Assembly is uh, the parliament of humanity, the norm setting body of the organization, and we can make the difference. And why is that we can make the difference? Precisely uh, because of every, every member state at the General Assembly, we all sit in the same seats, they're all the same. We have all the same microphone to speak. We have the right to speak, all of us, 193 plus three uh, observer uh, member states, and we have the same button to vote. So this parliament of humanity has to deliver better, of course. We are in a process of revitalizing the work of the General Assembly, but it is indeed the most democratic body. And they have been several gains and several achievements of the multilateral system. I don't have the time to go through them, but just think, uh, you know, climate change, think the sustainable development goals, uh, international treaties on disarmament, uh, uh, the conventions, uh, the, uh, the treaty bodies for human rights, the conventions on persons with disabilities, etc. you name it. Uh, there are a list of achievements, but sometimes we tend to focus on the shortcomings and the challenges. And I think I'm fully, fully committed to making the United Nations more relevant to the people we serve. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. We're rapidly running out of time, Mr. Foreign Minister. Well, Thank you very much. I, uh, I hope I can cover uh, all the questions, but I know that we are running out of time. Just uh, two, I think, a quick comment. Uh, one on, on the Middle East uh, and the Arab Peace Initiative, and the other one on the GCC agreement. I think uh, these are, are the more relevant to us here. Uh, regarding the Arab Peace Initiative, this is an initiative which is supported by all the Arab countries, which is requiring uh, the recognition of uh, the State of Israel in exchange of their full withdrawal from all the 1967 uh, uh, lands and the territories of, of the Palestinian. Now, uh, since the Arab Peace Initiative been laid, uh, there is no breakthrough uh, in, 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 uh, in the negotiations. There is no any movement. And this doesn't justify the Israelis' actions uh, uh, against the Palestinian people, against the innocent people over there. And also doesn't justify that uh, some of the Arab countries, they go uh, for the normalization before uh, or overcoming uh, the Palestinian issue. We believe that the Palestinian issue will remain at the center of, of the relation between any country in this region and Israel, despite uh, uh, the connections and uh, the communications which is maybe happening right now between countries. We hope that it will be used for uh, the good of, of the peace process and will help in a bringing peace at the end of the day. But the full normalization, we don't see it. It will be uh, uh, fruitful unless we get uh, what mentioned in, in the Arab Peace Initiative. This is for, for the lasting peace. For regarding the GCC and uh, the way how is this regional uh, alliance has been undermined by this crisis, this is something we totally agree with. That's why when we mentioned about regional alliances uh, uh, here, that these regional alliances needs to be reshaped and to be redesigned, that a new governance principles need to be in, uh, put in place. There is a full participation of all uh, members in, in shaping uh, this governance structure and should be a binding structure for all the countries. Today, GCC and the Secretariat of the GCC, they have no teeth, they have nothing. They, they don't know how to resolve any issue. They, don't, they, they have mechanisms in place. They never trigger these mechanisms because some countries, they believe that those are non-binding mechanisms for them. 
but we need to make sure that all the rules and uh, principles that we are submitting to, that is binding to everybody uh, in this region, and should have a clear dispute resolution mechanism to be put in place that all the results will be binding to hold all the countries accountable for anything they have done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Prime Minister, please try to be brief also. We are, uh, I think they will make me uh, suffer, uh, uh, the, the organizers, because I go, go into overtime. Uh, thank you. As I've said earlier, new, new alliances uh, are happening as a result of either conflict or um, seeking economic influence or engaging in competition. Um, that said, therefore, uh, it is very apparent now that any conflict that takes one part of the world has a direct impact on other parts of the world. Uh, the issue of the GCC is impacting us politically, economically, uh, security-wise, uh, which in reality means that the world cannot stand idle and watch uh, conflicts unfold as it will have an impact, the issue of the IMF's forecast on, on economic um, slowdown, it is very important, therefore, we think of preventive strategy, which hasn't been the case. In the case of the European Union, I think there's a major role for the European Union, which they can play, and I hope now with, with uh, you taking the leadership, you, you will take that as an advantage. And in the case of Somalia, I would like to admit that the European Union is actually investing in Somalia, and they are taking a leadership role, and we see that as an example of where the European Union as an institution is functioning. Finally, the world is as good as it is leaders, and if we are not able to agree on global warming or preventive strategy on poverty, then I think it is time that we uh, not solve a crisis, but come together as early stage so that we can debate all these issues. Thank you very much. The last word goes to Romania. Yes, I'll, I'll try to be extremely brief. There was a first question, multilateralism and bilateralism. It's obvious that the big economies, the biggest economies in the world, they are more tempted to work on a bilateral level in comparison with the multilateral level. That's why, from our point of view, the European Union is one of the strongest supporters of the idea of the multilateralism and will continue to promote it, even if sometimes there are problems in the relations with even some of our important partners. Secondly, Palestinian question. I think it's wrong to say that the European Union was taking the side of, of Israel uh, in comparison with, with Palestine. On the contrary, I can assure you that the peace process in the Middle East at the level of the European Union is one of the top priorities. We are waiting, of course, to have a peace plan maybe by April delivered by the United States, but the European Union is already preparing for, uh, for some initiatives on people uh, movement. And I can tell you very directly that the basic approach of the European Union is the idea of two states living in peace and security in that region. Yesterday, I had a meeting with uh, uh, Minister Malki of, uh, of Palestine, together with six other ministers, we had a joint commission and we signed some agreements in the cultural, educational field and, and others, health care, emergency activities. I don't want to, to pre prolong it, but we had a very good discussion with Mr. Malki and it's obvious that Palestine, Palestinians are ready to enter into a dialogue and the support of the European Union will be there. About the uh, JCC, yes, I think the, from our point of view, as I said, this, the, only, the only approach is the political negotiations, but I have to add, 
it has to respect the principles and the rules of the international law and especially the equality is practically to this panel I, I want to thank all four of you uh, for these really interesting um, contributions. I think this was a quick uh, overview over some of the pressing global and regional issues. I think we could have spent another hour or more on, on this. Thank you very much for participating. I apologize to the organizers for going into a bit of overtime, but I think it was worth it. Thank you very much. And thank you to the panel for, if I can have your attention for just a moment. Thank you uh, to the panel. Thank you to the audience as well for very challenging questions. I can tell everyone wants a break. It is time for a break, but let me kind of set the table for you for what you're going to return to. Um, the UN's Under Secretary General for Counterterrorism will be here with the UN Presidential Envoy for the Global Coalition Against ISIS. So um, if everyone could take a break for about 10 minutes and please be back at 11.05. 11.05, everyone. We'll see you in just a few minutes. And our sponsors, Qatar National Bank, Qatar Petroleum, and Oridu. Thank you very much. See you in 10 minutes, everybody.